Uh, welcome to the Rieti webinar on the effect of COVID-19 on global value chains and future prospects. Today, we welcome Dr. Sebastian Mihudo, a Senior Trade Policy Analyst, Trade and Agriculture Directorate of OECD, to introduce some of the recent experiences related to supply chains and risk events and his thoughts on future prospects. He's the author of a paper, Resilience versus Robustness in Global Value Chains, some policy implications and a number of working papers before that on the topic of global value chains and indeed one of the leading thinkers on this important topic. We also have Dr. Kimu Funari Kimura from Keio University, one of the leading trade economists in Japan and chief economist at AREA, Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia to provide some comments. As COVID-19 continues to sp spread, the pandemic has had a huge negative effect on uh, global value chains in various sectors, including uh, medical supplies, electronics, automobiles, and textiles and clothing, among others. Some state that the pandemic has brought to light economic vulnerabilities that are inherent in global value chains and point to the need to shorten the supply chain and or bring production capacity back home. Others state that the focusing of production back home or in any single location merely increases risk and point to the need for diversification of the production chain. Yet others state that despite numerous past disasters, GVCs have continued to deepen and conclude GVCs will survive and continue on its current path. Companies and governments continue on the search for an optimal way forward on this important issue. Uh, we will ask Dr. Mirudu and Dr. Kimura to make short presentations, after which we will have a short discussion on the effects of COVID-19 on global value chains in the short term and long term, and what companies and governments should take into account in considering next steps. My name is Osamu Nodera from the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, who will serve as moderator of uh, today's discussion. Uh, Sebastian, welcome to uh, Rieti. Thank you very much for uh, coming. Without further ado, Sebastian, uh, may I ask for your presentation? Well, th thank you very much. Let me share my uh, screen. Uh, with you for the presentation. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be uh, in this uh, Rieti uh, seminar. Uh, what I would like to, to discuss uh, today with you is uh, the effect of COVID-19 uh, uh, on global value chains, uh, but also the, the kind of policy implications, uh, in particular having in mind the kind of new debate we have uh, on whether something is wrong with global value chains and whether we should have new policies that would be about reassuring or shortening uh, value chains. Uh, so the, the first thing to, to be said is that uh, there is a huge impact of uh, COVID-19 uh, on uh, global value chains. Uh, of course, COVID-19 uh, is first a, a health crisis, uh, but this uh, health crisis uh, became a big economic crisis. And in terms of the impact uh, of trade, even if uh, at the, uh, we are uh, still uh, in the middle of the year, we don't have all the data, but what you can see here on this slide is that we can expect a big uh, trade uh, collapse. Uh, and if we, we look at a, a leading indicator, which is a global manufacturing uh, export orders uh, for chasing manufacturer, uh, managers in this is, uh, we can expect this uh, trade collapse to be even bigger uh, than the one observed in 2008 uh, when we were talking about the great trade collapse. So maybe now we have the greater trade collapse. Uh, and this, by definition, uh, will have a huge impact on the global value chains, but mainly through a demand effect. But what has triggered uh, maybe uh, the debate we have now on global value chains uh, is more some may, what has been described as uh, vulnerabilities uh, or maybe dysfunctionments uh, in relation to some very specific uh, value chains. And maybe the symbol uh, of these uh, issues were uh, what happened with uh, the face mask uh, and the shortage uh, uh, in face mask. Uh, and that's what has triggered some new concerns about the global value chains. I will not go into, I have a case study at the OECD, but you have the link uh, there. We're not going into the, the detail uh, today, but it's, it's an interesting uh, example. Uh, and I can come back to this uh, during the, the discussion. It was because, um, uh, so my objective uh, today is maybe to reassess a bit this uh, evidence on the impact of COVID-19 on global value chain and discuss uh, the policy uh, implications uh, based on some work we, we've been doing uh, at uh, OECD. Um, 
what we see is that at the end, uh, we would say that GVC is particularly for the uh, essential goods. So because of course, with COVID-19, many governments have put in place some uh, lockdowns. So the many uh, economic activities uh, have stopped. Uh, but uh, for some goods and particularly the essential goods, uh, that's where the global value chains were somehow tested during the crisis for, for their resilience because they had to continue to produce. And somehow uh, what we find at OECD is that these GVCs were rather resilient, particularly in uh, the food supply chains, uh, where if we remember again uh, around 2008, there were some food security issues and fortunately we have not witnessed this uh, anymore and also for the pharmaceutical. But of course, there was a major, major shortage for key medical supplies, like uh, supplies like the uh, face mask, but it really came from a, an anticipated surge in demand. And that's, I think, the kind of issues we need to address in the future. And interestingly, uh, this shortage has been addressed mainly through GVCs. Uh, so uh, initially, people somehow uh, looked at China, which were con was concentrating half of the production of face masks, and, uh, because uh, the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic started there, they uh, used first the mask for themselves and did not export anymore. So it's, it's I think, what has triggered this uh, debate. But at the end, it's also China that has really uh, ramped up and increased the world production of face masks and has also solved uh, the shortage. Um, but uh, what I would like to highlight is that when we talk about reshoring, shortening supply chains, I don't think we really address the key questions uh, raised by uh, COVID-19. Because the first one, uh, as with the example of the face mask, is really how you, you address uh, a surge in demand. Uh, and for this, uh, I believe that strategies like buffer stocks, stockpiling, uh, more agility and reactivity in supply chains are, are rather the, the answer to avoid the repetition of, of what we, we, we've seen with the face mask. Then there is a broader question, which is maybe uh, beyond just uh, the value chains for essential goods, which is how to diversify supply, how to address also uh, bottlenecks. And here maybe the solutions to look at are rather uh, in terms of stress tests, uh, adding more transparency in the value chain, uh, rising the risk awareness. Uh, but what is clear is that if we focus on domestic supply, we really reduce the channels for adjusting to economic shocks. Uh, and it really limits the options we, we have, uh, particularly uh, when we are in the recovery phase uh, of uh, the crisis. So in, in a paper I've recently published, what, what I've uh, tried to do is to, uh, to go back to the management literature, uh, where there is, I think, an important distinction between the robustness and the resilience in GVCs. Uh, so what we call robustness is the capacity to continue to produce during a crisis, whereas the resilience is the ability to return to normal operations after uh, the crisis. So people will tend to use resilience for both, which is fine for me. But what's interesting in introducing this, this distinction is that maybe uh, you, there are different uh, management strategies to achieve robustness and resilience, and maybe also different policies that can support the effort of companies uh, to achieve uh, robustness and resilience. And what we have seen, uh, not, uh, and uh, it's interesting because a lot of the literature is coming from a, uh, uh, 2011, uh, after the dramatic earthquake uh, in Japan, but the same year you had also some floods in Thailand, so that's where uh, many people started to look at these issues in the GVC literature. And the conclusion was that complex value chains are maybe less robust. They are really disrupted when you have a natural disaster or a crisis, but they tend to be more uh, resilient in the sense that having a large network of suppliers, it really helps you to recover more quickly uh, after uh, the crisis. So how can we uh, improve uh, robustness uh, in GVC? So robustness be, being the capacity to, to, to be able to produce during the, the crisis, what also people call business continuity. Uh, so here you have, uh, I think first it's at the level of companies and you have the traditional steps in risk management, which are information and risk assessment, the choice of the risk management strategies, reactivity uh, and, and agility. Uh, and, and, and uh, somehow it's really the companies themselves that can organize uh, how they will react uh, when there is a disruption and find the best way. Uh, and it's also a, a lot at their management level uh, that they, they can prevent and uh, prepare the company uh, to be ready. Uh, but what is discussed now is uh, whether uh, for increasing this robustness, you need more redundancy in suppliers or supplier uh, diversification. And here it's interesting because 
again, it would not lead to domestic production only. Uh, you know, the idea is that you should not keep all your eggs in the same basket. So supplier diversification involves some offshoring and some international uh, value chains. Uh, now, what's interesting to, to uh, try to understand is what can be the role of governments to help the companies in this effort to, be, uh, uh, to build more robust GVCs. Uh, I think when we talk about the crisis itself, there is a very important role, of course, of government to uh, maintain the functioning of key infrastructure and in particular trade transport network, which is something we, we could also look at uh, more closely as a consequence uh, and some kind of lessons to be drawn from COVID-19 and also adjusting regulation to help firms to cope with the, the emergency and what they have to do to adjust uh, their production. Uh, but then uh, the governments have also an important role to play after the crisis uh, to prevent future crises, to anticipate future crises. Uh, governments should be as prepared as companies and also have some uh, contingency plan. So we could think that uh, in terms of the uh, personal protective equipment, for example, if there, if there had been some plan uh, to be able to uh, ramp up the production of ventilators, face masks, it would have helped a lot, of course, uh, during uh, the height of the uh, crisis. Now moving to the resilience uh, in GVCs, uh, so how we, uh, governments uh, can help, but also how companies uh, can recover more quickly after the, the crisis. So what the management literature suggests here is that it's really uh, about the visibility in the value chain. Visibility means that you, you really need to know who are your suppliers, but also who are the suppliers of your suppliers and so on, to be able to assess where there will be a bottleneck, because maybe one input will not be available, but really upstream in the value chain, you need to be able to anticipate this. You, have also, you need also some visibility on the demand side uh, to see uh, what kind of fluctuation there will be uh, in demand. Uh, and so companies that do this very seriously uh, have a, a very uh, deep uh, information systems where they assess the time to recover for each of their uh, supplier. But what we see also is that these companies don't do really diversification. They prefer to work with a, a single supplier, but with long-term relationships, because based on this relationship, there will be more commitment from this supplier uh, to recover uh, more quickly. What would be the role of government here? Again, I see the government are important to create a stable regulatory uh, environment. There is also one kind of risk which is important for companies, the policy risk, and this one is also really in the end uh, of government. But we would think also that government can uh, try to raise risk awareness, in particular for new risks that companies are maybe not yet familiar with. Uh, we can think about all the risks related to the digital economy, for example, the, the, that are new. Uh, and uh, in terms of raising risk awareness, some people discuss uh, the possibility of running stress tests. So during the financial crisis, we had stress tests uh, uh, to assess uh, how the capital uh, of a bank, but we could do the same to uh, assess whether firms are ready uh, for a pandemic or for another type uh, of a crisis. So let me now come to, to the question of uh, reshoring. Uh, for me, the, the first issue with this idea uh, is that uh, the, the organization of value chain uh, is really uh, international and you, you cannot really change this uh, unless really uh, going really backward in terms of how we were producing goods uh, and services. Because in the value chain, all what is uh, upstream in terms of research, uh, R&D, design, all this is really done in uh, innovation clusters, in cities, and it's really difficult to change the location of, of this city. Uh, then you have raw materials that really depend on, on the geography. Not all countries uh, have oil, for example. Uh, then when you go to processed inputs, each of these processed inputs themselves have their own uh, value chain and you have countries really specialized in these inputs. And when you look at downstream in the value chain, you need also to be close to consumers, particularly with a new trend, which is the servicification of manufacturing. So when we talk about reshoring, maybe it's just the final assembly and the first tier suppliers, which means that you will have always some kind of international part of your value chain and you will have to deal with it. Uh, then um, all the policies that I've mentioned so far are really about accompanying companies, helping them in their efforts to be more resilient. Um, with reshoring, maybe we talk about policies that are no longer uh, in terms of cooperating with companies, but somehow pushing them or forcing them into some um, business models that maybe uh, naturally they, they would not adopt. 
Uh, and so the way you would promote domestic production would be at the end, uh, inevitably, through some trade barriers, maybe tariffs uh, on inputs, some investment barriers, investment screening, the traditional industrial policy tools, some subsidies, maybe even government control, because uh, how can you decide for the organization of value chain? It's really the management of companies, so the government would have really to be involved in a micro management of the company. So all this would lead to economic distortions. Uh, we may also think that it would trigger retaliation across countries. So I think that uh, this uh, that would be a bad idea to go in this direction and really a threat for, for the recovery uh, from the crisis. Uh, so what would be the way forward? Uh, I think policies for GVCs need careful consideration. I mean, it's good that we have this debate. Uh, so somehow I, will, I welcome that there are new ideas and that we discuss this. Uh, but we, when, when it comes to uh, uh, changing our policies, we need to be sure that the benefits of new GVC policies uh, will outweigh the risk. And maybe the current uh, situation uh, where we are not yet out of COVID-19, uh, it's not the best time to experiment with new trade uh, and investment policies. We should really focus now on the recovery. Uh, but we could maybe imagine some kind of soft version of a reshoring strategy uh, that would not be like against companies or forcing them uh, into some uh, production models they don't want, but maybe some companies uh, will find a business rationally uh, in reshoring. Uh, maybe they can build some uh, real uh, competitive domestic production, uh, and it could, uh, in some cases, improve their risk management. But the tools for government in this case uh, would uh, not be the kind of trade distortions I've mentioned before, uh, but the policies uh, that would support this uh, would be more in terms of improving business conditions, promoting investment in education, in skills, uh, in innovation, in infrastructure, and I would imagine also uh, more international cooperation. So you have people, for example, who discuss the idea of GVC councils, uh, so it would be like private, public platforms where you would have the governments, but also all the companies involved in the given value chain and discussing uh, regulation, bottlenecks. So this kind of cooperation could also maybe help uh, and prepare companies and GVCs for, for future crises. So let me end my uh, initial remarks here. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sebastian Sams, for a very uh, interesting presentation. I think uh, your point that the uh, uh, Initial uh, problem uh, with uh, the uh, with the uh, medical supplies were more an issue of uh, sudden surge in demand and not a really a global value chain issue per se. And I think, uh, but having said that, uh, there were issues that were related to the global value chains, and I think uh, uh, there is room for improvement. And I think uh, that is a, a point well taken. Uh, next, I will uh, uh, go to uh, Dr. Kimura, who uh, actually has a, a number of comments uh, he would like to make. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, thank you very much, Sebastian. Uh, great to have you here. Uh, actually, uh, his claim on uh, robustness and the resilience uh, that is very important uh, claim uh, when we talk about a sort of uh, 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 possibility of uh, reshoring and also emergency goods like uh, face masks and other goods. Uh, we really have to distinguish these two very clearly. Uh, that's very important. And also uh, he talked about uh, some sort of deliberate, deliberate uh, policy to uh, encourage reshoring. Uh, on the side of uh, developing, developed countries, I think that could be very dangerous. So I really share his views on uh, global value chains a lot. Uh, so this is not quite a sort of comments. Uh, I'm trying to rephrase uh, his uh, claims basically. And I, I like, uh, if my interpretation is something wrong, I like to I like him to point it out later. Uh, and then I, I like to talk, rephrase uh, his claims uh, in the context of East Asia. And uh, then uh, what, what sort of additional things we have to think of uh, when we talk about the global value chains. That's what I like to do from here. Um, so as a background uh, in East Asia, particularly, uh, uh, what, what happened is at the first we had uh, we had we have to have emergency responses, 
uh, basically we we are having uh, various kinds of social distancing uh, com uh, and then actually at this stage uh, both uh, production and consumptions are, are restricted uh, so uh, initially we had some supply shocks coming from China uh, particularly uh, medical equipment related things and other things uh, and then for other goods, other than uh, medical equipment, essential goods, the uh, so production system is uh, basically uh, there, uh, almost intact uh, so far. Uh, so, uh, but, but the low demand shows down, uh, slows down uh, global value chains. Uh, that's what we observed so far in emergency responses. Uh, and then the coming stage is the exit stage, and we will uh, face two obstacles. Uh, one is a huge uh, negative demand shock, and that, that we may have a really prolonged recession. And also, uh, we have to remove uh, the restriction on people's movements, uh, domestic and cross-border. But we, uh, we gradually notice that it may take time to remove uh, the restriction on people's movements uh, perfectly. Uh, so, so in that kind of uh, situation, some people claim uh, that the uh, uh, era of uh, GBC is over sometimes, so they claim that. And also reshoring, uh, that means that uh, putting uh, production uh, blocks and others uh, right now in uh, developing countries uh, should go back to uh, developed countries, uh, that is so-called reshoring. Uh, then some people claim that the reshoring is necessary to make uh, value chains more robust or resilient against shocks such as pandemics. And then Sebastian uh, rightly challenges uh, such a claim. So and I really share the view on that. Uh, then uh, one key uh, message is uh, robustness versus resilience. Uh, in, his in his presentation. Uh, he, he said that coming, uh, this is coming from management literature, uh, but he defined the robustness and the resilience. Robustness is the capacity to continue to produce during a crisis. Crisis would come, uh, but still uh, the capacity, uh, uh, still uh, production can can be continued, that is so-called robustness. And then the resilience, resilience is that uh, even, even having some dis disru disruption, uh, the, we, we would have a sort of ability to return to uh, normal operations, that is resilience. Uh, then he said that uh, uh, some, some complex value chains, uh, including, uh, including uh, multiple countries, uh, uh, actually, uh, that kind of uh, value chains are less robust. Uh, that means that uh, th there's some uh, transmission uh, of uh, uh, shocks through value chains, probably, uh, but uh, more resilient, uh, uh, more likely to coming back. Uh, and also, uh, he talked about the differences between essential goods, emergency goods, versus other goods. And then uh, efficient risk management is very, very important for both. And I, I think this is very important. Um, it's actually, the robustness is very costly, uh, even more costly than resilience. And so uh, the robustness should be, should be there, uh, perhaps only for essential goods. So those are a uh, key, key message that uh, he'd like to make uh, in, in presentation, in my interpretation. Then actually, uh, there are a bunch of empirical studies in East Asia for the past economic crisis, uh, starting from uh, Asian currency crisis, global value chains, and also in the context of Japan, uh, East Japan earthquake and others. Uh, we had a bunch of economic uh, empirical studies. Uh, th then uh, what we found was uh, uh, pretty much consistent with his claim. Uh, so body, global value chains can be a transmission channel for a shock. So we observed that in automobiles and others. Uh, however, uh, network trade, a uh, trade in uh, production networks is less likely to be disrupted and more likely to revive. Uh, so, uh, so a network as a whole, network trade as a whole is actually uh, uh, more robust uh, rather than less robust uh, and also more resilience. Uh, that's wh what we found. 
So, so I think the key is the nature of a global value chains, particularly in the context of East Asia. Uh, so GVCs in general, uh, that includes uh, say natural resources and other things. Uh, so some trade is a very slow and also uh, transactions are pretty much a sort of market transactions. Uh, but uh, if we talk about the international production networks in machinery industries and others, that is, uh, uh, so-called the, the second unbundling in the wording of uh, Richard Baldwin. Uh, those, uh, that kind of uh, networks uh, include uh, relation-specific transactions. Uh, those types of transactions are probably more robust and also more resilient compared, compared with other types of uh, uh, transactions. So uh, something beyond that, uh, in the context of East Asia, uh, he did not mention those, but uh, I think uh, I'd like to point out uh, some issues related to global value chains uh, in the context of East Asia. Uh, one is uh, the China factor. So uh, actually the East Asia other than China first perceived COVID-19 as a supply shock or uh, we, we had actually the interruption of imports from China uh, in January and February. So actually this triggered uh, the argument of uh, too high dependency on China. Uh, we put uh, too many eggs in one basket. That kind of argument uh, came, uh, uh, actually that was encouraged by uh, the, the initial supply shock. Uh, however, if we look at uh, the production, uh, production situation in China, actually the production in China seems to be ready to resume. So, uh, so a sort of initial worry is uh, slightly different from what we are talking about now. And then if we think of uh, economic aspects, uh, are we really having uh, too many things in China? Uh, in the context of Japan, uh, it, it seems to me a sort of sh shaky logic over there. Uh, situation may be a bit different in the in case of Korea, and the Korea is uh, really uh, having a very very tight relationship, economic relationship with China now. Uh, probably too too large portion of uh, economies are connected to China, but in case of Japan, probably not. Uh, so actually, the, we have a sort of mixture of uh, geopolitics here. Uh, so now the U.S. and China and China and the other developed countries. Uh, having a relatively uh, difficult situation uh, geopolitically uh, and the people are talking about uh, economic decoupling. So, so I think the reshuffling of GVCs would depend on the extent of de decoupling. So that is just limited to some, uh, uh, limited to some uh, IPR related goods or private data related goods uh, or maybe a little bit more in uh, high tech or uh, something beyond. I think that, that how far we really have to commit to decoupling, uh, that would be as a very important issue when we talk about the possibility of reshuffling of GVCs in East Asia. And then going to uh, policies, uh, one thing that I hope that I'd like to share a view uh, with Sebastian is that the GVC can still be a source of efficiency and competitiveness, at least in East Asia. Uh, I, I'd like to confirm that uh, Sebastian would agree on that or not. And then his argument was uh, policies uh, on the side of developed countries, policies against market mechanism uh, could be very costly. He talked about the uh, sort of various uh, policies related to forced uh, or encouraged uh, reshoring uh, or trade protection, investment restriction. Uh, those could be very costly. I totally agree on this point. And how about uh, policies on the side of uh, newly developed and developing economies? Uh, I, I think uh, that the deeper involvement in GVCs can still work in East Asia. So uh, ASEAN and East Asia can strengthen uh, uh, factory Asia potentially. Uh, and also uh, digital transformation. Uh, uh, that, that is another very important issue. Uh, one is that the ICT could strengthen GVCs uh, and also ICT is uh, good for uh, traditional industries uh, like agriculture, transportation, tourism, and also uh, upgrade government services. 
Uh, and also ICT is uh, generating new businesses, uh, including service outsourcing or third unbundling. That would give us a uh, sort of different types of uh, uh, global value chains. Uh, actually, Sebastian is writing a lot on uh, services and other things, and I'd like to have some sort of opinion on that too. And lastly, uh, what would come next? Uh, I think the huge demand shock will come and also still uh, restrictions uh, on uh, people's movement is left over. So uh, I think the prolonged recession may come at uh, all levels, at the country level, regional level, and also global level. So uh, international production networks are robust and resilient against a short run shock. Uh, that's what we uh, observed in the past. Uh, but the long downturn of the world economy may trigger substantial reshuffling. Uh, we've already observed a sort of a, a big damage on uh, transportation logis logistics sector. And also uh, eventually uh, small medium enterprises or local firms uh, in global, in, in, uh, global value chains production networks may hurt and more in general uh, on both uh, developed and developing country sides, uh, bad businesses will become, unemployment may go up, and also crisis in the financial sector may come, uh, possibly uh, the collapse of uh, asset foreign currency markets, those would come. So uh, what we should do, so certainly uh, health policy and the macroeconomic policy are important, but uh, in addition to that, what sort of policy will be needed for uh, production networks? That's uh, another point that I like to hear the Sebastian's opinion. Uh, so these are references related to my work. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kimura, uh, for your extensive comments. Uh, there are a lot of points that uh, you made, so uh, we have to uh, see uh, which ones uh, Sebastian wants to uh, deal with first. But uh, maybe we can start off uh, with uh, uh, the issue of whether GVCs can be a source of efficiency and competitiveness, uh, the cost issue. I think uh, related to uh, increasing robustness and resilience, uh, both maybe from uh, the uh, country uh, perspective and maybe from the business perspective. Maybe you, you would like to care to comment on that first, maybe? Okay, well, th thank you very much to, to Dr. Kimura for uh, excellent comments. I mean, I, it's true we, we are in agreements on, on many things, but uh, I think he added also many uh, important points, uh, in particular on, on this, uh, uh, question of uh, cost. So, so it's true that uh, what I've described as a robustness is a very costly strategy. And in particular, when, when you read the, the management literature, uh, they are not really convinced by this idea of redundancy in suppliers or supplier diversification, because finding suppliers, uh, uh, certifying their products, uh, building some uh, trust uh, relationship with them, it's a long process, it's costly, and uh, for a company, it can take like one or two years to identify one supplier. And when they have done this, they are happy and want to stick with this supplier. So finding additional suppliers, uh, it's a lot of time, it's costly. Then it creates issues because uh, uh, these suppliers uh, are in competition or one, they don't feel uh, the same uh, guarantee that they, they will continue to produce the input. So you have many complications as well when you deal with uh, several suppliers, but, but it depends also on the type of input. So, uh, companies have some very specialized inputs and here they need some long-term relationship with their supplier. Then you have more basic inputs, more homogeneous product where maybe you, you can diversify. But that's why uh, the literature, when, uh, the management literature will not go too much in this idea of uh, uh, redundancy uh, in uh, suppliers. Um, but uh, the rest, I mean, other ways you can improve robustness is also costly because uh, at all stages in your production process, uh, you need somehow to, to create uh, some uh, process to cope with uh, any type uh, of risk. Uh, so it's a bit like uh, an insurance. So uh, you pay uh, for this cost, but you do it because maybe one day you will face a crisis and some of the consequences of this crisis may be worse and uh, you may lose more money at the end uh, than if you had not taken the steps to prevent it. So. Uh, you have to balance somehow the cost of the disaster or risk we, we are talking about 
uh, as opposed to uh, what uh, what your risk management strategy uh, will cost you. So again, that's really something only companies can uh, can decide and find the, the right balance. Uh, but where I think the government can play a role is that they could tell for specific sectors, and here I agree with, with Professor Kimura, like for some essential goods, uh, and again, if we come back to this face mask or ventilator, the government has the right to ask these companies where if tomorrow we have a new pandemic, if I increase uh, my uh, uh, orders by 10 or 20, are you ready? Uh, are, are you prepared for this? And the government asking this, the company can see what would be uh, the cost of uh, implementing a strategy that would allow them to fulfill uh, this uh, commitment. And maybe you can, you can imagine some kind of government support or so. Uh, but it's really on a case-by-case -case ba basis working with the uh, companies. And I think with some type of platform with a public-private public, public uh, private partnership that you, uh, you can uh, uh, achieve this. What I would like also to say on, on, uh, on uh, the cost, uh, so we can distinguish essential goods from other goods. Of course, we would have a debate what are the essential goods because today we talk about face masks or ventilators. It's obvious because we are in the middle of a pandemic, but we don't know what's the what is the next crisis and what, what we don't regard today as essential may become essential tomorrow. So that's also the difficulty. But I think it's also within companies and uh, you have also this debate now whether uh, you we should abandon the just-in-time strategy, so this uh, lean production, where you try to reduce inventories as much as possible, too, because uh, inventories uh, are also costly, and go to some just-in-case uh, strategies. Again, I think it really depends uh, on the, the different type of inputs, the different part of the production process. So companies will identify uh, inputs that are essential, uh, part of the production process that are essential, and there they will invest more uh, to uh, have uh, some procedure in case of, of uh, a risk. Uh, and then there are other parts of the value chain where they know uh, that uh, the risk is lower and they can still keep, for example, the just-in-time strategy. So again, that's where I think it's not really the government which is in a position to say what is best for the companies. And also when we talk about uh, these global value chains, and that's also, I think, a, a point the Professor Kimura made, uh, they are very different and they are organized differently. So you have some value chains where you really have a lead firm which has a full control of the value chain. And so here, working with the lead firm, you can somehow implement a resilient strategy for the whole value chain. But you have also some value chains where you don't really have a lead firm, uh, that are where you have many uh, companies in different countries, and these ones are more difficult maybe to, to organize. So we have also to think how uh, we can promote resiliency uh, in, uh, in such uh, GBC. Um, now coming to the important point uh, on uh, efficiency, competitiveness, yes, I, I really believe that uh, right now, uh, in particular when we talk about some sophisticated goods and products uh, like the semiconductors, the mobile phone and so on, I don't think it can be fully domestically produced. Uh, again, if we talk about simple products, so concretely what the countries discuss now in terms of reshoring, it's things like pharmaceuticals. And among the pharmaceuticals, uh, the most basic one, uh, like uh, uh, the painkillers, or for, for, for this kind of good, you can imagine that you can reshore production. Uh, but if you look at the value chain for mobile phones, for example, it's impossible for companies like Apple or Samsung uh, to organize production domestically. And for this complex good, you, you cannot do today without some kind of international value chain, which does not mean that this value chain will, of course, change uh, and evolve. Uh, and here, I think that uh, what uh, Dr. Kimura said uh, is very important in East Asia. Maybe the evolution uh, is driven uh, more by the geopolitical uh, factors and by the uh, China factors than maybe uh, COVID-19. Uh, uh, we can think also about the digitalization. Uh, he mentioned also something I, I'm working on, which is the servicification uh, of manufacturing. So we can imagine some changes in global value chains. And they may also become shorter because of this servicification and because it's more important to produce now uh, next uh, to the consumer. Uh, but uh, they will still remain very global, uh, international. Uh, and uh, again, what, what, what is uh, the main economic mechanism uh, is uh, in terms of uh, uh, competitiveness and efficiency, it's really specialization. 
Uh, so if you look at semiconductors, Japan is a specialized in very important part of the value chain. We saw it when there was the earthquake because companies like Intel had, a, had a trouble in producing because some key inputs were not coming from Japan. But this kind of specialization, uh, it's uh, difficult to do without it uh, or to recreate it uh, in the whole economy. So if you are a large country, you can expect uh, to, to, to have, but even, I don't think even the US or China uh, can deal uh, with the kind of specific uh, inputs that you need to produce in very sophisticated value chain. That's why I, I don't believe, I believe the global value chain will evolve, will change, but we, we cannot really do without the, the global value chains uh, today. Uh, thank you very much, Sebastian, for your very, very insightful comments. Uh, Kimura-san, do you uh, want to comment on that? Yeah, uh, I think uh, in, yeah, a sort of key point in his presentation, uh, robustness and resilience, uh, his argument is uh, quite right. And, and uh, emergency goods versus uh, other goods, I think that kind of uh, notion was uh, very useful too. Uh, when we, uh, in the context of Japan, we had uh, Abeno mask, and actually uh, he distributed uh, face masks immediately in uh, February, and then that was uh, probably a sort of very popular policy. But he did that in May, June, uh, so that was too late. So, so I think the government policy could be uh, very inefficient in a sense <laughs> to provide a sort of a, a keep a sort of robustness actually. And also uh, uh, how we define uh, emergency goods uh, or essential goods, if we include food, uh, then uh, this is a, a sort of a, a long-term excuse of uh, agricultural protectionists, actually, in, in Japan, particularly in Japan and Korea. <laughs> so, so I think uh, we should not include all food, in a sense. And also, uh, even if uh, sort of domestic production is uh, going on, and that is very ine inefficient, and th that may not be robust, may not give uh, more robustness, actually. Uh, so, so I think we really have to be very careful on that. And also, I, I'm very happy that, uh, I'm happy to know that uh, Sebastian also shared a view that uh, still, still in East Asia, we really have uh, more uh, room for using global value chains for economic development. I think that's another very important issue. Uh, so in in uh, journalistic, uh, journalistic literature in the US and sometimes in Europe, uh, they are so pessimistic about the global value chains. So I, I think in this stage, I still we have a lot of room for using that uh, for that. So, so I, I'm happy to hear that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kimura. Uh, I, I also had uh, actually an interesting point that uh, when you talk about the robustness and the resilience, you do have to kind of differentiate between the business and the country. So there are some cases where there's a disaster in a country where, which might have a, an effect on the supply chain. There might be a, an effect on business. And businesses, of course, may have uh, uh, multiple locations for production. So there may be some cases where uh, dealing with a certain supplier which has uh, multiple locations of production uh, makes uh, the global value chain uh, more resilient. And that's uh, uh, probably what happened in the case of autos, for example, auto parts, uh, in the case of uh, Japanese uh, uh, production companies, uh, at least in the short term. Uh, I'd like to uh, move on to one of the points that uh, Sebastian made about uh, information, the, the need for information and the importance of information sharing inside the supply chain. Would you care to comment a little bit on that? And maybe I think uh, uh, Kimura-san might want to uh, comment on the ICT factor. Okay, so let me just add, uh, because you mentioned uh, Japanese car manufacturers, Toyota is now uh, an example in the literature in terms of risk management strategies, uh, because of course the, the company uh, had the first experience in 2011, but also before uh, they had also some issues with some inputs. And so they have uh, developed a very strong, uh, resilient uh, systems. Uh, and they claim that uh, they can resume production in two weeks, even if there is a, another major earthquake, for, for example. And the way they do it is, of course, because, uh, as you mentioned, they have a network of suppliers, but they have also really worked closely with these suppliers to ensure that they are also ready and that their suppliers are, are ready and so on. So that's really, I would like to insist on this visibility in the value chain. 
And that's where also, maybe because you can have some uh, asymmetry of information in the sense of for big companies like Toyota, they can have the information, but we, we need also to think about smaller companies. They may not have this visibility and you can have some asymmetry of information. They may not know that they depend and we can come back to uh, the dependency on China, for example, because when we, when we measure uh, with uh, our data, like uh, the trade in value added database at OECD, we don't find a high dependency on China. Uh, but when you look at specific products uh, and when you go upstream in the value chain, you can find that for some raw materials or others, suddenly you have this kind of dependency. So the visibility is to address this and government can maybe in some cases have more visibility or can help to set up tools uh, to create this visibility. And so through this, I'm coming to the, the other uh, relevant question you ask about the ICT and technologies, because precisely uh, in terms of creating this visibility, we have many new tools. Uh, if you think in particular of uh, all the work which is done on what is called the Internet of Things, the idea of adding sensors uh, on inputs, uh, what companies do today is that they, they create what they call a control tower. So it's a full IT system where they can, uh, in real time, uh, follow the stocks, the inventories, uh, the movement of inputs. So all these new technologies can uh, really help. Also, people talk uh, about blockchain now, which, has, which can also uh, play a role in terms of trusting. The, when, because when it's a, an integrated company, uh, the flow of information uh, is, uh, is uh, trusted. Uh, but when you work with uh, other companies, there is a question of uh, how to, to uh, trust the information and how to be sure also that you can uh, exchange information uh, under some confidentiality. So for all of this, you have new technologies and I think uh, uh, ICT uh, can help and the government can also promote uh, these uh, new tools, uh, encourage innovation uh, in these areas and uh, very importantly, create a regulatory environment that will facilitate uh, the implementation uh, of these new tools. Thank you very much, Sebastian-san. Uh, Kimura-sensei, do, do uh, would you like, care to comment or? Yeah, so I think when we just talk about the global value chains, we include the various kinds of transactions and also international division of labor. So in case of uh, say textile and garment and then wholesale, these are relatively easy to separate. Uh, so, uh, so, so, so actually uh, once, once the demand in New York uh, went down, uh, then actually the order uh, actually canceled immediately. Uh, so the, uh, some government was uh, at the port, uh, but the uh, order were cancelled, actually orders were cancelled sometimes. But uh, we cannot really do that in case of a relatively comp complicated machinery industries. So, so that, uh, some transactions are really relation specific. So they, they don't want to discard that kind of relationship uh, immediately because uh, they invest on that already. Uh, so, so I think in East Asia, we are doing a much more complicated uh, international, uh, international uh, division of labor rather than a relatively simplistic garment. So, so even in garment industries, uh, they, they, some are doing a relatively uh, sort of a much tighter uh, uh, division of labor too, actually. But, um, so, so I think that's a strength of uh, East Asia. Uh, having that kind of a uh, relatively complicated in international division of labor. Uh, then ICT is a relative, uh, of course, and a very important element to strengthen the communication uh, inside uh, networks too. So, so I think uh, uh, particularly right now, we cannot really move physically. Uh, people cannot move and how to sustain uh, this kind of production networks uh, will be very costly. Uh, uh, particularly, it's very difficult to set up new transactions, I guess. New business partners cannot be really found very easily in this kind of situation. Uh, so, so we really have to utilize the communication technology to uh, key, at least keep uh, the existing uh, relationship somehow. And, and also, uh, so we really have to keep uh, the, uh, the location advantages of uh, East Asia uh, uh, particularly a sort of a, a relatively complicated division of labor is allowed here. So, so for example, some introduction of robotics, for example, uh, industrial robots, I think that could be uh, relatively easy in East Asia than other parts of the world. So, so I think uh, that kind of issues are uh, coming in uh, together with uh, COVID. 
Uh, thank you, Dr. Kimura. I, I wanted to uh, touch on, uh, although uh, time is uh, running out, I wanted to touch on two points. First point is one point that uh, Kimura-san made, which uh, was very interesting, is uh, the demand shock. Uh, uh, the uh, COVID-19 effects are becoming more prolonged, uh, I think, than uh, people initially envisaged. And so that may have a profound uh, effect on global value chains. Uh, Sebastian, would you like to care, care to comment on that point? Yeah, no, no, I, I agree. It's true that we, we focus the discussion on, on a supply shock and uh, on the supply chain risk, uh, because initially, as uh, Dr. Kimura explained, uh, what we saw is that a lockdown in China and some inputs were no longer available uh, to produce in the rest of the world. And we were looking at the cascading effect in GVCs. But yes, now uh, we see that uh, there is a, a, a real recession, uh, that the demand uh, will stay low uh, also because, uh, as Dr. Kimura uh, mentioned, even if in manufacturing we see uh, production resume, uh, there are sectors like the tourism, the transport sector, many of services, uh, where we really need to, to see some of the end of the virus to, to seriously uh, think about some kind of uh, recovery. Uh, you know, for like the air transport sector, people don't think that maybe we will have to wait 2024 or 25 to go back to the uh, level of uh, uh, um, flights that we observed last year. Uh, so it will take some time. And uh, as Dr. Kimura uh, highlighted, it will have an impact on the global ocean because again, the global value chain, uh, it's not just manufacturing. You have uh, services to link all the manufacturing activities. So when we talk about transport services, uh, tourism, but also uh, we have to think that movement of people, it's also a movement of business people, and it's really uh, affected. And uh, we have some uh, anecdotal evidence, but like uh, uh, Apple, uh, they, uh, the only reason they could uh, delay the, the release of their new iPhone at the end of the year uh, it's because uh, they need some engineers from California to move uh, to the factories uh, uh, in China to, to check the, the work done there. Uh, and so the, the restrictions on movement of people can have an impact on the manufacturing value chains. So if, uh, I mean, if there is a, a vaccine in the coming months, maybe uh, we can think that the, the recovery will be at the end of the year. But if not, and if we are uh, uh, more months in this period, where we have to live with the virus, uh, firms will have uh, to adjust more their production process uh, and the configuration of value chains will be, yes, even more influenced by the fact that for some services uh, activities, uh, we cannot uh, produce as it was possible uh, just before the crisis. Thank you, Sebastian San. Uh, Dr. Kimura, I think you uh, have the view maybe that uh, uh, the, the disruption in the global value chains may have a, a deep impact on uh, human resources or uh, other kind of uh, uh, infrastructure. Uh, uh, do you care to comment? Yes, uh, I think that demand shock will be very, very huge. Uh, at, at least we just look at the sort of forecast uh, of uh, uh, ec economic uh, growth rates actually very very low, and then uh, I think that the demand shock could be much much larger than uh, even global by global financial crisis. So so I think uh, uh, the transportation sector or logistics sector, the related to services uh, related to global value chains, will be at a really immediate risk. And also, uh, I'm worrying about the small medium enterprises, uh, local firms uh, related to value chains. And uh, multinationals may survive, uh, but they, may, they would have a lot of uh, difficulty in uh, survive and, and also keep production networks in coming year, years. So, so I think uh, that would have a huge impact on the uh, human capital issues too, particularly in uh, newly developed developing countries. Uh, so in the past, in the, in the case of global value chains, uh, so many multinationals and also big companies uh, tried to keep uh, employment and then actually they did, did not have much production. So, so they did a lot of training and also some reshuffling of uh, production lines and others. They use a sort of human capital like that. But uh, this time whether uh, they, they could do that or not, they would have a sort of, uh, some sort of breathing room 
for doing that or not, I, I'm really worrying about that. So it's not just an issue of uh, giving subsidy by government and others, but uh, they should do uh, many things uh, as, as, as much as possible to keep production networks. I think that is a very important issue. Uh, that will be a very important issue in the uh, newly developed developing economies in East Asia. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kimura. Uh, and uh, so finally, I'd like to uh, uh, touch upon the issue. I think both of you agree that the GVCs are, are going to continue going forward to be important, especially for developing countries. Uh, and for developed countries, maybe it's not the really realistic to try to reshore everything but uh, to uh, maintain the global value chains. Now I think uh, um, uh, I read in uh, uh, an interesting article in uh, Peterson Institute about uh, Mexico and Vietnam increasing its presence in the global value chains. Uh, do, would uh, both of you maybe care to comment on uh, what uh, countries should do, developing countries should do to try to uh, increase uh, their presence in the global value chains in the uh, current uh, situation. So yeah, yes, you, you, you are right. Um, and it's also related, I mean, we, we don't really see reshoring in our data, even if there, there are some companies that do reshore in US or, or in EU, but we, we see uh, a lot of uh, restructuration of GVCs uh, in particular, related to the tensions with China, where companies move their production to Vietnam, to India, to Mexico. So there are also opportunities for these uh, emerging uh, economies. And again, I, I believe that we, we will still see global value chains. I, I really believe that there are opportunities for these countries. We see also, uh, even if it's not uh, discussed that much, interesting things going on in Africa uh, with uh, some African economies that now start also to, to really participate uh, in the global uh, production networks. Now, in terms of the policies, what we, we have recently uh, developed uh, uh, at uh, OECD, uh, in particular in collaboration with uh, Professor Harry Van Ash from HEC Montreal, is what we call the ABC of GBC uh, oriented policies. So, A is for attraction, so it's really uh, about uh, trade, investment openness, uh, but also all the regulation institutions so, so that your, your uh, economy is attractive for foreign companies. B is for buzz. So here it's really uh, related to all this literature on uh, innovation, research clusters, uh, and all what happened. You know, Bal Richard Baldwin says that the, the factories of the 21st century uh, are cities. So it's really also about creating uh, cities where you have knowledge spillover, where you attract the talents, the universities, and so on, and create these knowledge clusters. And C is for connectedness. Uh, which is a connectedness in terms also of uh, knowledge and research with a uh, foreign country. So uh, even if it looks like an old fashioned <laughs> uh, policy recommendation, we believe uh, it's still the ABC of uh, what uh, countries and in particular developing uh, economies should do to increase their participation in global value chain. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Kimura? A ABC is good. I, I have to read that <laughs> article. Um, I, I, I think it's a very, uh, important moment for, for example, ASEAN uh, member states uh, to even strengthen uh, the location advantages and uh, a sort of attractiveness uh, for uh, investment. I, I think they did that uh, in Asian currency crisis, global financial crisis, but this time they should do that much more in a kind of really organized, uh, strong, at a strong stance. Uh, so, so the shock is very huge. Uh, so in, uh, value chains will be reshuffled uh, here and there. So they have to uh, collect some, some, some uh, elements uh, coming from other regions too, including China. Uh, and also uh, geopolitics is, uh, seems to be uh, more and more complicated now, but uh, they would utilize uh, sort of a positive uh, trade diversion effects or investment diversion effects. So, so Vietnam and Mexico seems seem to uh, catch that kind of wave. I, I think this is another very important issue. So in any case, uh, I think they really have to think of uh, global value chains very seriously. Uh, the, the, sometimes uh, policymakers uh, ju just jump into a sort of new businesses uh, new digital businesses, that's very important too, but uh, they forget about uh, uh, so 
global value chains. I think that's a, a sort of big mistake. Uh, still, they can do many things on that, uh, at least in coming decade. So, so I think that's uh, one very important thing that I like to claim. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much for a very, very extensive discussion. Maybe I'll uh, uh, give, turn over to both of you for a few final words if you wish to uh, make some comments, final comments. Thank you. Sebastian? Well, no, so thank you very much for, for having organized this uh, interesting webinar. The, the final comment I would like to make is that right now the policy mood is really in, in some kind of unilateral policies and not so much international cooperation. But I think this topic of GVCs uh, can be in the future really an area where countries should uh, talk to each other, whether it's through the RTA, the regional trade agreement, the bilateral agreement, whether it's WTO or some kind of new forums. I've mentioned this uh, uh, kind of GVC councils. There is a need uh, to discuss uh, the issues uh, of uh, GVCs uh, within the same room, the businesses, the countries, uh, and to really move forward with new types of uh, regulation and discipline. Uh, thank you very much, Sebastian. Uh, Dr. Kimura? I was very happy to know that uh, Sebastian agreed on a sort of a future of uh, value chains, particularly in East Asia. Uh, I, he is uh, writing a lot of uh, very interesting articles. In the last, last year, you wrote uh, one uh, discussion paper in a ADBI. Uh, so, so the certification, manufacturing versus services. I think that, that that kind of issue is going to be very important too. So in the next round, I'd like to discuss on that. So thank you very much again to both of you and to the audience for listening in. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I hope uh, be, be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.